Did you know that most 18th century garments can be sewn with only a few basic stitches? The same is true for most time periods, really. It seems to be a common misconception that the actual stitching is the most difficult part, but believe me, it isn't. Draping? Maybe. Fitting? Sure. Stitching? Not particularly. Don't get me wrong, you can't just pick up a needle for the first time and make gorgeous lines of tiny back stitches. At least I couldn't. This requires a ton of practice and patience, but with both, you can absolutely master it. Before you start, there are a few vital things you need to have on hand. Well, that's not even true. You can totally use a random needle and whatever thread you can find. So instead, I'll point out what I like to have on hand. A good needle is pretty important. I have two favorites and I'll link them down below. One is short and great for quick stitching, and the other is longer, super fine, and a little bit bendy. Because I work mostly in linen thread, beeswax is vital. I use this to condition the thread to strengthen it and prevent breaking. This isn't necessary for cotton or silk threads. Speaking of threads, extremely fine linen thread is my favorite to use for most historical purposes, but today I'll be using a natural cotton just so you can see what I'm doing. I also like to use this particular thread for basting. If you're new to hand sewing, I highly recommend you learn with a thimble first rather than do things backwards like me and have to unlearn a lifetime of bad habits. At this point, I can't be without it, but it's definitely something you have to get used to. Number one, running stitch. I very rarely use this to put a seam in anything, unless it's the night before an event and I'm halfway through a petticoat, which has absolutely happened, but this is still an extremely useful stitch for gathering fabric or for holding things in place basting before using a more permanent technique. The stitch length depends upon the reason you're using it. If I'm basting, I have been known to make my stitches up to half an inch or more, either because that's all that's needed or because I'm impatient. For gathering though, you want these stitches to be no more than one to two millimeters, or if you're working with a shift or a shirt, the needle should pass over no more than four to five threads of the weave. Number two, back stitch. In direct contrast to the running stitch, the back stitch is just about the sturdiest one available. Back stitches are made by essentially looping the thread back on itself and creating a sort of continuous spiral. For each stitch, the tail of the thread should be between where the needle enters and exits the fabric. The great thing about this stitch is that it's incredibly difficult to break or tear out. The bad thing about this stitch is that it's incredibly difficult to break or tear out. If you think using a seam ripper on machine sewn seams is a pain, I invite you to try ripping these out. Backstitch with caution, please. Because of this strength, backstitches are what you'd expect to find on just about any hand sewn seam, with the exception of those that will take no strain. For that, you'd likely use the next stitch. Number three, running backstitch. The best of both worlds, this has nearly all the speed of a running stitch with the added security of a few well-placed back stitches. This is accomplished by starting off with a back stitch, then taking a pass of running stitches, around two to four depending on your needle length, how strong the seam needs to be, and your own comfort level. Follow this pass with another back stitch and repeat. The running back stitch is great for any seam that won't be taking direct pressure. I wouldn't put it on a sleeve, but the side of a gown skirt is a great place to use this. If I'm in a massive hurry, I'll also use this on the side of my shifts and shirts, but I think that's generally frowned upon. Number four, spaced backstitch. Another variation on backstitching, this can be used on seams just like the stitches I've already spoken about, but I've seen it most often as top stitching. Personally, I use this most along the seams of my gown bodices, but also as a reinforcement on sleeves. This stitch is made by literally spacing out your back stitches, so rather than having the tail end of the thread pop up directly between the needle entrance and exit points, the needle is going into the fabric about a millimeter behind where it exited before, and coming back up a few millimeters past the end of the stitch. Sometimes called a prick stitch, because the visible amount of thread is absolutely tiny, it's weirdly satisfying to do and is my favorite of the stitches mentioned in this video. Number 5. Whip Stitch 
Depending on your definition of a whip stitch, this might be the most commonly used, because the same physical motion can be used in a variety of applications. The main idea is that the whip stitch always goes in the fabric from the same side, and it usually moves in one continuous direction in a spiral motion. This can be used for seaming fabric pieces together, specifically in 18th century stays, or for creating eyelets, in felling seams, and for hemming a garment. Because most of these things are better served as separate tutorials, I'm just showing you the hemming and or felling application here. And that's it for now. I know this isn't a comprehensive list and there are a few more stitches that you'll see in historical sewing, but if you're starting out and you just focus on these five when you're learning, you'll be so much better equipped to create fully hand-sewn garments in the future. I do very much hope this video was useful to you. If you did like it, please consider hitting the subscribe button because I'll be back with extra tutorials on the more weird, weird works, more tutorials on the weirder historical stitches you might need at some point. Thank you so much for watching. See you soon.